Welcome to Think Tech on OC16, Hawaii's weekly newscast on things that matter to tech and to Hawaii. I'm Jay Fidel. And I'm Maria Kashem. In our show this time, we'll cover better education through Gen Ed, a look at how regular required general education college courses can help our students. We'll talk to some students and faculty at Hawaii Pacific University to see how they define an educated person and what benefits they ascribe to a liberal arts education based on the gen ed courses offered. College courses have dramatically changed and expanded to suit the needs of a more specialized economy. There are so many unconventional courses and degrees out there these days. But what about the basics? Those fundamental things everyone ought to know to live in an increasingly competitive and global society the things college students have been studying since the beginning of higher education. A group of media students at HPU recently tackled this issue and interviewed people on all sides of it. Those students included Ryan Lamb and our own Maria Kashem, under the direction of Dr. Malia Smith on the HPU faculty. We're delighted that they made the inquiry and that we have their footage to show you. It's a Right now, I'm a senator uh, for the state of Hawaii, and I'm, in a, I'm a part of a 25-member Senate, and uh, the, the capital is just a couple of stone throws from HPU's campus, the downtown campus. You bet. My name is William Smith, or Bill Smith, and I am the vice president of Boy Gaming Corporation and the general manager of Vacations Hawaii. So we handle charter services from Honolulu to Las Vegas five times a week. My name is Jason Cottonella, and um, I launched Nella Media Group uh, going into year four now. Um, my background has been strictly media. I've been doing it since I was an undergraduate uh, as an intern, and, then I, and I worked my way up um, through different departments. When you're out on the, on the floor of the Senate and you're trying to make a point to your colleagues, I mean, your ability to communicate with them has got to be spot on. The writing skills that you employ, fortunately around here, we got great writers too in the different agencies or in our uh, uh, Senate Majority Office. When you're able to go into a situation and present yourself properly and you learn the techniques of listening and of being able to write, you're able to present yourself in a lot better way. And I think it's, it's the foundation of my success. Now a media group started with a newspaper, Chinatown newspaper that's currently in Honolulu, Portland, and San Francisco. And then we um, worked a partnership out with Go Mokalele Airlines to do Innovate. A friend of mine, Lisa Yamada, uh, which launched Flux Magazine, we partnered up about a year ago, and uh, she has a strong editorial background. I have a strong business background. We launched this one together called Room Service, and today we have four publications. Just balance your, your learning years, you know, with uh, uh, the discipline of, of an education and uh, also being able to be social, socially conscious, civically engaged. I think you got yourself a really nice balance, uh, you know, foundation. You need somebody that's well-rounded. You know, you can have a specific area that we look for a graduate, if it's accounting or something like that, but basically we need someone who has the communication skills, who has the PR skills, a, a self-thinker, someone that can get a job and we can put them in an area and they need little supervision. So you have to be well-rounded and be able to communicate. And I think that's, that's the key. A potential intern mm -hmm. um, within my organization, it's, 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 it's crazy to say this, it's not even crazy to say, it's personality. Um, we need people that are outgoing, fun, energetic, and of course we want them to learn and, and really enjoy our industry, but our whole company is built, it's open wall, there's no cubicles or offices, it's, you have to be outgoing and friendly and uh, be, be able to speak in the eye of many people. And not, be, and not be afraid of it. What does it mean to be an educated person? 
Education goes beyond a degree. Education requires an understanding of one's place in the world in pursuit of a productive and meaningful life. An educated person can solve problems and adapt to new circumstances. Also, an educated person will have no problem and no shame in asking questions because he who asks questions is a fool for five minutes, but one who doesn't is a fool forever. Well, an educated person is someone who can engage in lifelong learning. That they're capable of analyzing the things that they see, especially things in the process of change. And global awareness, because, because of globalization, we're not by ourselves. And that's probably a modern, you know, a contemporary definition of someone who's well-educated. A well-educated person is someone who can speak in depth and be very knowledgeable about a bunch of different subjects, no matter what someone's major is or what they're interested in, someone that can respond with an intelligent answer. You know, another thing about a college education in particular is freedom. Uh, you're free to say things, you're free to ri take risks, you're free to uh, fall down on your assignments and see the consequences without losing your job. And so it's really the only time in your life where you get to make decisions on your own and explore the consequences, as well as learning about those kinds of things in class. And the result is uh, college-educated students are actually better entrepreneurs, you know, they're better investors in the stock market, they're better able to dis make decisions about family, because they've actually had an opportunity to kind of really grapple with these issues. To begin with, I, I like the quote from, I think it's William Butler, Butler Yeats, and he said something to the effect that um, education is not really about filling up a, a cup or a vessel, it's really about igniting a fire. And it got me to thinking about the concept of an educated person, and I feel as if that's become maybe a cliche in that it's a past tense. It suggests that at some point we're educated, we have a college education or we have whatever that is and now we're done and now we just go forward into the world. And I really prefer to think of it as a person of education and that's someone who continuously reignites the fire. I think a well-educated person is someone that actually has the critical thinking abilities to actually understand a concept or an idea and that they understand it so well enough that they can teach someone else because they've learned it truly. It is something that you do for yourself, but it also is something that gives you the ability um, to do things for other people in a much more complex way. That you can bring more to the world and you can do more in terms of making a difference. Um, however it is that you make a difference, even in small ways, but the ability to make a difference the ability to change, I think, it just changes exponentially when um, you're well-educated. Although HPU provides a strong general education program with an array of eclectic courses, students often ask, Why do I have to take all these courses beyond my major and field of interest? What exactly will I get out of the liberal arts experience? What are the benefits of gen ed anyway? Uh, it's been a while since I've been an undergrad, but I mean, this gives you a, an overall general sense of every subject, and it, and it helps define what you want to get into when you're older. So it helps define your actual major and what your interests are and what you're strong at, so therefore you can accent on those later on in your future to, to decide actually what you want to do. I'm an anthropology major, um, so that's humanities, right, under liberal arts, and I actually came in to HPU as a freshman um, st straight on my marine biology degree and through my general education courses I actually took um, a wild card in anthropology, cultural anthropology, and I absolutely loved it and it actually swayed my decision and I've been pursuing an anthropology degree um, since. The liberal arts can also be viewed as the liberating arts in that they free an individual from bonds of ignorance. It means learning to think critically and independently and using those skills to fulfill one's full potential in life. I think that a liberal arts education provides a person with that foundation to be an educated graduate and not only 
allows them to look into their own specialization or a topic that they're interested in, but it gives them that grounds to explore other topics that they might not have if they weren't in a liberal arts program. Like for me example, I'm a psychology major and I was able to take a lot of psychology courses, but I was also able to take language, literature, geography, other topics that I wouldn't have explored other than that. Uh, my dad wanted me to go into nursing and I wasn't too sure that was my uh, where I wanted to be. So um, I think it was a reprieve from, um, from just making that decision straight away and kind of gave me some time to think about all of the things that are out there that you can learn about. It's a wide-ranging view, a multi-dimensional view of life, not just one target at one at a time, but we like to think that people have a well-rounded view that they're able to um, take into, into account all aspects that give meaning to life and uh, give purpose, give beauty, and companionship. A liberal arts education provides an opportunity for students to um, interact and learn about different parts of the world in different subject areas. For example, I'm an environmental student, science student, and um, I get to learn about how the, the science that I'm learning about actually impacts different cultures in different places around the world, as well as economics. Some people might think, well, why would a liberal arts foundation be important for business? And actually, within business, it goes back to the first question, which is you have to be able to think, you have to be able to solve problems. It doesn't matter what your discipline is within business. So if you are in marketing, then you need to know the entire value chain of business. You need to know the whys you have to understand kind of a historical perspective. You have to be able to understand your external environmental conditions, all of the things that help you think and see and view that context all come from a liberal arts foundation. There's nothing like film from creative students. Their work shows that foundational college courses are essential to a rounded education, a competent workforce, and an informed electorate, and that it is not in the interest of the students the schools, or the community to marginalize the value of gen ed courses to our graduates. And now, let's take a look at our ThinkTech calendar of events going forward. ThinkTech's 4 to 5 p.m. weekday drive time radio series on KGU 760 AM continues this week. Tune in to 760 AM every weekday at 4 p.m. and raise your awareness on ThinkTech Radio. On August 23rd, the Hawaii Venture Capital Association and ThinkTech will present a luncheon panel program called Keeping Up with the Jones Act. Is it still relevant to Hawaii's economy? This will feature a panel of maritime lawyers, executives, and experts on the waterfront who will take a fresh look at the Jones Act and what it means to Hawaii. Sign up for these programs on hbca.org. And now, here's Bill Spencer, president of the Hawaii Venture Capital Association, with this week's Spensation. Well, you know, Bill, we're, we're coming down the, the last half of the year here, and the HVCA you know, think tech programs uh, have been quite successful so far this year, and uh, there's a couple of them uh, in the next few months that ought to be very interesting. Um, we, we have just uh, finished, we just wound up our uh, Herding the Cats filmmaking in Hawaii, um, and uh, now we're going to go on into the August program, and the August program is uh, Keeping Up with the Jones Act. <laughs> is, like it, is it still relevant to Hawaii's economy? That's the title. 
and uh, we have one panel in that case of experts around the waterfront, of, of lawyers and executives, uh, you know, in the shipping business, all of whom have very strong ideas, one side or the other, about whether something should be done to the Jones Act. A lot of people feel the Jones Act uh, has been irrelevant for a long time and only only hurts Hawaii. Other people feel that um, it, it still helps Hawaii in, for various economic reasons. And then there's the third crowd who feel that it should be changed in some, in some ways for special exemptions, because the, the argument is that if you have no exemptions uh, or not enough exemptions, then uh, you know, the act is too stringent, and a lot of people feel that way. So uh, this is a topic which has profound effect, I think, on Hawaii. Uh, we don't, you know, that we're we're in the water. You know, we're surrounded by ocean. That's right. Um, it's all a matter of of uh, shipping. Uh, everything we do, everything we consume, it's really all from the shipping. And I don't think we spend enough time figuring out how the waterfront works. Uh, there's a lot of vect uh, vectors uh, around the waterfront, a lot of political considerations. I think the problem is we don't spend enough time. The public does not get out there actually understand and take positions on these issues. Once in a while you see an op-ed piece, but it's really not enough. Uh, we really need to address this. We can't, we can't leave it to our elected officials to go off and do what they think is right without consulting us. The well, business community has to be involved. Some would argue that uh, you know, the elected officials have just been at the beck and call of the, the maritime industry and the shipbuilders, and we have not much of a uh, shipbuilding industry anymore. Uh, so w what are we protecting? I think the other thing is there are issues like LNG, for example. You know, um, the Koreans have already demonstrated the capacity to build ships that can transport liquid natural gas, uh, but we can't uh, buy those ships and use it to bring LNG into Hawaii. We've got to find somebody that, you know, can start from scratch. Here are the people that are concerned about how this affects uh, competitiveness. And when we're so dependent on incoming shipping for 95 percent of everything we use here, uh, I can't help but think that we're getting a, a hurt, you know, and that there's, there's margins that, are, uh, that could be cut a little bit. So I think you're right. It's time for a discussion. Mind-boggling that a, a, a law that was written in the, you know, turn of the century practically can still be, uh, you know, in place without having been tweaked. And, and we're, in the, we're in a whole new century, and there's a lot, uh, a lot of issues. I mean, we, you can ship things in airplanes that haven't been built in the, in the United States. Uh, just because you can, you know, just because you have a, a big boat that can haul a lot more stuff, um, I don't know. It just, it just seems very strange to me that we haven't um, addressed this. And then, then there are the exceptions, as you say. You know, oh, somebody squeals loud enough, well, we'll give you a special exception, so you don't have to abide by the Jones Act. Well, who's making those rules? So. Yeah, it's, it's gotten to be all political. I mean, it was all political at the beginning, I think, but... Uh, there was uh, at least the argument that it had a relationship to national defense and to America's uh, supremacy on the seas. But I, I, don't, I don't think those arguments work anymore. And at least there's a valid controversy about it, and we ought to address it. And, and the public and the business community, you know, should, should get involved in this. One of the other issues is what opportunities for American uh, entrepreneurs are being denied. You know, we think about what we're protecting, but... Are we closing off avenues of, of uh, economic growth that otherwise might be open yeah. if, if there were no Jones Act or a modified Jones Act? Yeah, and, and look at tourism. Look, you know, there are, there are all of these ships that, that are flagged elsewhere uh, who really can't come to Hawaii because, you know, they make two stops, two sequential ports, can't do that. Um, so we, we're losing a substantial amount of trade because we, we, uh, we still because the Jones Act stops it and the Passenger Services Act. Suffice to say, uh, this is one of those areas where you say, aha, does the public understand this? No. Um, does it affect the public? Yes. Uh, we really have to have public awareness about this issue. 
It's one thing that Dan and OA has protected the Jones Act for all these years, but I think we have to update on that, and we have to see what is really the best policy. So this will be an important program as far as I'm concerned, um, and I think it affects every one of us, whether we have any contact with the, the waterfront directly or not. Uh, it has a direct it effect on us. us. I think this will be uh, one of those programs where you say uh, we should have studied this before. <laughs> well, that's what we do. That's what we do. Fourth about. Thursday of August. We'll see you all there. August 23rd, okay? Plaza Club. Sign up at hvca.org. And here's our co-working entrepreneurs, Ray Chung Fujihira and Tony Stanford, to keep us current on their latest adventures at the Box Jelly. This week has been a little bit of a trying week. But you know, you can't have all the good because you gotta, with some of the bad comes the good, and so you appreciate the good even more. We have missed our dead mark as, as far as doing the build out, but that's okay, uh, this is such as life. So we have some materials coming back and, and we're moving forward with that. And we're still looking to be able to finish by the end of the month. We, but uh, there is some silver lining in this. We also been able to finish High Caps Room, and they're very happy. They actually launched one of their first events within their own space, and so they did a GitHub class project and seminar um, with uh, with their own community, and they branched out to some more designers, which was exciting to see. And so they've uh, have nothing but great things to say around. So that keeps us going forward. Um, as one steps back, another stepping forward, um, Kailua. Kailua is happening and is speeding up in a major way. This week we went down there, um, we actually got the commercial lease agreement in hand and we're going through it right now. So we're just looking to be able to get that opened within August. So we're going to have a, a second space in Kailua, which is very exciting to see. Um, there's a lot of people down there that I've been talking to and that seem like they would really appreciate it. So this might be a really good market for a jelly market, uh, hoping, hoping for good things. With that, um, you know, as we're looking at other spaces through the grapevine, someone through Chinatown came by and approached us with the, looking to do a jelly box of their own. So, <clears throat> you know, this uh, August might be very exciting in terms of finishing up the build out uh, opening up one in Kailua and possibly a third location in Chinatown. So this is very exciting. As you can see, um, my business partner, Ray Chun, he's not here. Uh, as, as we do, we wear many hats uh, as being entrepreneurship, and he is teaching our youth today at the Punahou School um, under Camp Bismarck, and he's really teaching them the ways of entrepreneurship, showing that there's another way out there than just getting a job, which which is good. It's for the children. And so with that, as always, um, the box jelly is a place to meet, a place to build, and a place to work. Work the way you live. Thank you. And here's some additional today's footage of our daring interview team, Stefan Day and Lauren Day, with more satire about everybody's favorite controversy, rail. Our next guest is William McCullohan. He is the Director of Finance for High Speed Rail Systems within the Department of Transportation. Now in Hawaii, there's been a lot of talk about how we need the money from the federal government. Will that happen? I, well, I can't say exactly if it's going to happen immediately. What you've got here is uh, you've got a bankrupting federal government that's made a lot of promises to a lot of other places, and you guys aren't even a swing state. I mean, this is a very political country. Everyone likes to think it's about increasing infrastructure and stuff like that, but it's not. It's really about buying votes and winning hearts and minds, just like we're doing overseas, right? But won't it cut down on traffic, and don't we need it? That's not really the primary concern. It's about um, who's going to get paid, who's going to make a lot of money. So if your department um, decided to release the funds, would our proposed rail system qualify for federal government money? You're really talking about a small stretch of rail that's going to uh, serve a very small group of people. And it's not going to exactly clip along very fast, is it, right? So we're, we're in charge of high-speed rails, and you don't exactly qualify for that funding. You have to get it up, or you'll just get a wee breeze going through your hair, and then, uh, then you can qualify. You mentioned that our rail system might not qualify for federal money. What kind of project would? Well, you've got to look at it from the scale of the federal government, right? We're trying to uh, leave a legacy behind with the dollars we're putting out there, and we're trying to uh, create great jobs, stimulate industry, 
and um, create positive relationships. So uh, your project lacks in what we call scale, right? It's a bit of a small project and it doesn't stir up a lot of people. We can't do a press conference about a railway going from one little town on the outskirts of a city to another little town. But what we can do a press conference about is a big bridge, right? Say a big bridge that's going from one island to the other. I mean, they're getting away with building bridges in other states that don't even go to another island. They just go out the middle of nowhere. So, I mean, really get creative with it. Stick in the back room and go like, okay, what's really going to put Hawaii on the map? Is it going to be a railway system that doesn't even go into Honolulu? Or is it going to be, say, like a bridge that goes to, say, Molokai? There's talk in Hawaii that our government is cutting back um, the money for the bus system in order to help fund the rail. What are your opinions on that? Ah, we had a game back home where you take a, you get three cups, right? And then you put a little ball in one of the three cups. And then you keep moving it around like that and you see if you can figure out where the ball is at the end of the game. Sounds a little bit like that. So, William, thank you so much for being on the Today's Show. You probably did not learn very much, but we hope that it was entertaining. We'll be right back to wrap up this week's edition of Think Tech. But first, we want to thank our underwriters. Thanks to the Scheidler Family Foundation, which supports a number of educational, cultural, and charitable organizations, including ThinkTech. Hawaiian Electric Company and its affiliates, Miko on Maui and Helco on the Big Island, are deeply committed to the communities they serve. Galen Ho is a senior executive of BAE Systems, a global defense, security, and aerospace company, and CEO of CBI Polymers, a tech company in Hawaii. The High Tech Development Corporation, the state's leading technology agency attached to the Department of Business, Economic Development, and Tourism. Okay, Maria, that wraps up this week's edition of Think Tech. Remember, you can watch Think Tech on OC16 several times every week. Can't get enough of it, just like Maria does. For additional times, check out OC16.tv. You bet, Jay. For lots more ThinkTech videos and for underwriting and sponsorship opportunities on ThinkTech on OC16, visit thinktechhawaii.com, be a sponsor or a volunteer, and help us reach Hawaii. I'm Jay Fidel. Thanks so much for joining us on ThinkTech. You can watch this show throughout the week and tune in next Sunday evening for our next important weekly episode. Aloha, everyone. I'm Maria Kashem. See you next time. <laughs>